Let us turn up the beat. It's time for Architecture, Coffee, and Ink. Hello, this is Hollywood C, and you're listening to Architecture, Coffee, and Ink a podcast dedicated to introducing concepts, detailing out designs, and tackling the architecture you might not realize the meaning behind. I'm your hostess, and I'm here today to start introducing you to the designs that make you wonder why. So I ask you to brew your coffee, grab your sketchbook and pen, and let's begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode. I hope those of you who are also snowed in this week and weekend are also staying snuggled up and warm. It has been doing wonders for my chores and to-do list on both weekends, let me tell you. And today's episode is somehow both perfect and a bit of a tease as we are going to be talking about Central Park, located in the middle of Manhattan and operated by the Central Park Conservancy. Once we finish up in January, we will finish up our New York City arc and get back to exploring the architecture and designs of the world. And even more exciting, I am working on arranging some potential guest episodes again for February. For today, we are going to focus in part one on introducing the three major figures in the park's history, as well as their importance to design and landscape architecture. In part two, we are going to shift to the full story including Seneca Village, the design, and the physical construction of the park up to the modern day, including several additions and renovations. Basically, part one is an intro and people, and part two is history and design. There's a lot to cover, and it's less overwhelming to break it up into chunks, so even though I am dividing it up, it still feels like I could write three more books and a TV special and not cover it all. Just remember, as always, to always check your sources, check your facts, and most importantly, check me. I also want to issue another warning if you decide to research this topic further. A lot of primary sources from this time period printed propaganda, misinformation, and smear campaigns. I am super against that. This podcast again celebrates all the people and cultures we discuss, and I don't link to any sources that support that. But if you research this topic further, please be aware it is out there. Our story today starts much later than the previous episodes in this arc. We are jumping forwards in history. Between the 1830s and 50s, NYC was experiencing an extremely large jump in incoming immigrants. At this point, it is estimated that they were seeing around 15,000 people coming into the city each year, according to the New York Preservation Archive Project. As a direct result, the city is beginning to see some overcrowding problems, including several epidemics like malaria and chloria breaking out. Without the infrastructure to support the population, pollution was increasing as waste and people had nowhere to go. There is a distinct lack of social spaces, programmed and otherwise. Heavily influenced by European parks, people were passionate about the need for a public park. Amongst a growing group of advocates was Andrew Jackson Downing. Downing was a landscape architect and publisher of the Horticulturist magazine. Not to spoil the next episode, as much as you can spoil anything from the 1800s, But Central Park was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox, and it was Downing who actually introduced the two. Originally, Calvert Vox was an English architect who had worked with Downing previously. Downing was among several who believed that a public park would elevate the status of the city, the health of its people, and cure social problems. They wanted to focus on an area around the Croatan Waterworks Reservoir, which we will discuss in more depth in the next episode. But before we launch into the full history, construction, and design, I wanted to focus this episode on introducing the history and impact of Andrew Jackson Downing, Calvert Vox, and Frederick Law Olmsted. Downing was a designer, author, horticulturist, and in some ways, one of the first American landscape architects. He was born on October 31st, 1815, and died on July 28th, 1852. He was born in Newburgh, New York, and his family had a plant nursery business. He actually ended up joining the firm early as a teenager and taking over his brother's share and naming it the Botanic Garden and Nurseries or the Highland Gardens, where he started to self-advertise himself as a landscape designer. 
He largely took the initiative to educate himself and quickly established himself as an expert across the nation. His writings crossed both landscape and architecture and focused on the needs of the middle-class homeowners. Over the course of his life, he wrote several essays and treatises, and in no small part, he was responsible towards gearing early American design towards the picturesque, which is to say rolling pastures, natural beauty, and promoted suburbs and raised concerns about over-industrialized development. He published four books between 1841 and 1850, including ones that I've read for classes, which establishes principles and practices. He borrowed heavily from existing European principles and ideas as a starting point for his own and focused on adapting them to America. While he was altogether a naturalist, he did change his mind and start advocating for exotic plants, which may have been driven by his own nursery business in no small way, as this idea pretty much only lasted until he reached the point where he was identifying more as a designer than a salesman. He worked with Alexandra Jackson Davis on a magazine, The Horticulturist, which was targeted towards wealthy clients. This arrangement started with him reaching out to Alexandra Jackson Davis to illustrate one of his books. This would continue throughout the rest of his life and career, as it was met with rousing success. He was a huge advocate for the picturesque and public parks being implemented in America, and believed that it required architecture to blend in with the landscape. He also believed in developing agricultural education and attempted to launch a state program from 1849 through 1852. Unfortunately, it did not proceed. He did, however, help others publish, including Frederick Law Olmsted. He also designed his home and would partner with Davis on a few designs, though most of them he would pass along to Davis as Downings had never received formal training in architecture. However, he did go on his own trip to London in 1850, where he met Calvert Vox and encouraged him to move to the U.S. and accept a job at his firm. He and Vox would go on to become partners in Downing and Vox Architect. They would work on multiple projects together throughout the Hudson River Valley in Long Island until his death in 1852. He passed away in a fire on the Henry Clay Hudson River steamboat. It caught fire and he drowned alongside 80 others. His wife, who was on the boat, however, survived. At the time of his death, he was working on a plan for a public garden for Washington, D.C. After his death, a design by him named the Downing Urn was added to the National Mall in his honor. Downing's plan for Washington had been accepted and the ground had been broken at the time of his death and as a mass change from Perry Charles Lafont's original National Mall. The plan was partially created around the Smithsonian, but due to funding, never realized. It would later be used by various members of government to develop individual parks later on, but unfortunately none of which survived to this day. Both Olmsted and Vox stated that he played a huge influence in their Central Park design, and Vox actually named one of his children in Downing's honor. Their very last work together was on a park in his hometown of Newsburg called the Downing Park. Several of his works survive today, including one in Georgetown, D.C., and Springside in Poughkeepsie, New York, which leads us to Calvert Vox, our second major player in the history of Central Park. Calvert Vox was born in England in 1824 and died in 1895. His works have featured collaborations with an extensive network of partners, including the previously mentioned Downing and Olmsted. He partnered with everyone, designers, architects, landscape architects, and was a part of massive projects that are still infamous to this day, including Trinity Cemetery, Bra Mars College, and of course, Central Park. He was formally trained as an architect and also studied landscape design in England, but is commonly referred to as an American architect. However, he chose the title Landscape Architect according to the Cultural Landscape Foundation, which arose directly from his work at Central Park. When Downey and approached Vaughn, Downey was already a famous designer, so following him across the pond back to New York was an incredibly smart career move. He worked with him for two years before Downing died, 
and then he moved to New York City to continue Downing's campaign for the park. Once the land was secured and purchased, and we are absolutely talking about that more in the next episode, he encouraged the arrangement of the design competition that would select the plan for Central Park. And, of course, he asked Frederick Law Olmsted to join him and submit an entry themselves. Of course, it feels a bit unfair if the person who arranged the competition won the competition, but since no one asked me, their plan was selected. Olmsted ended up leaving New York, and it took some considerable time and effort for Vox to convince Olmsted to continue designing with him. However, he did return, and we will discuss that more in a moment. Olmsted.org had the following quote from Alfred Jensen Bohr on the partnership of Vox and Olmsted. Quote, My impression is that Frederick Law Olmsted's reputation richly deserves individual recognition and separate honor as regards landscape work. But my conviction on personal and in some degree exclusive knowledge is that Calvert Vox was the sole designer of the guiding lines and main features of Prospect Park, end quote. And that seems to be a theme with them. And yet Vox is a person who is most frequently ghosted over in history. His works include the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Centennial Exposition in Philly, and the American Museum of Natural History, in addition to Central Park. Olmsted and Vox remained friends their entire lives, and despite Olmsted leaving again, continued throughout the years to work together off and on. They often attributed each other as the reason they continued to practice. Calvert's death is a bit of a mystery, as officially, he drowned after falling off a pier, after visiting his son, Downing. He was missing for two days before being reported, and it took another day for them to find him in Gravesend Bay. It was officially listed as an accident, however, articles at the time have questions that remain unanswered to this day. I have probably broken a cardinal rule by discussing everyone in the order I did, but we should take a second and discuss arguably the most famous contributor to landscape design quote, the father of American landscape architecture, end quote, Frederick Law Olmsted. He has been the center of both hero worship and outright hate over the years. While he was anti-slavery, his writings from that time are problematic, like most of the sources from that time period. However, he was an abolitionist, and his writings did keep other countries from supporting the Confederacy in the American Civil War, according to Professor John Stafford from the Department of African and African American studies at Harvard in an article for The Dirt. He was born April 26, 1822 in Hartford, Connecticut, the eighth generation in his family to do so, and died on August 28, 1903. And he lived a full life, and he was what many would call a jack of all trades, and seemingly dabbled in everything over the years. He was listed by his foundation website to have the following jobs at various times over his careers. A public servant, conservationist, landscape architect, journalist for the New York Daily Times, farmer, author, and businessman. But it started extremely young. His father was a wealthy merchant who would often travel and take Olmsted with him, especially when he married Olmsted's mother, who also had similar interests. He was sent away at age 8 to be educated by clergymen, and he later was accepted into Yale College in 1837. Unfortunately, it was not meant to be, as he ended up developing an eye infection and withdrawing after the first semester, according to the Olmsted Network. This was actually due to Solmac poisoning. So Solmac has the same chemical as poison ivy, which is called urosol. This is a resin. And like poison ivy, this plant causes skin irritation and strongly affects mucous membrane, like your eyes, the strongest. People have actually died from burning the plant, inhaling the fumes, and then it ends up attacking their lungs. So this was an extremely serious injury. His dad ended up helping him purchase a farm instead and traveling. One of his most pivotal moments was when he went to Europe on a month walking tour in 1850 where he went to Birkenhead Park and fell in love. Birkenhead was open three years prior and is considered the first park to be publicly funded in the world. After experiencing this park, he concluded that park access should belong to all. His involvement in landscape architecture truly kicked off in 1857 
when he and Calvert Fox won the design competition for parks, he had actually been the superintendent of the park. After that, in 1859, he ended up marrying his former sister-in-law and adopting all of his late brother's children. They had an additional three together, but only one son and one daughter survived. The most famous of their children are Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. and John Charles Olmsted. Family life didn't seem to slow him down for long, as he left for the South and started publishing again. In 1861, he left the position as director of Central Park during the Civil War to serve as the executive secretary of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, where he worked to improve conditions for the Union Army. Included in his reforms are camp sanitation, medical supply systems, medical ships, and implementing exercise and nutrition. He was also outfitted and personally recruited three of the first African-American regiments. He was also able to put together a ton of reforms. However, he soon ran into trouble. He was the original micromanager and refused to delegate and basically ran himself out of office by being permanently angry and making everyone miserable. He became physically sick and drained and was going to take it easy, which lasted for a grand total of one month before he was off again. He then went on to write another report in 1865 called the Yosemite Report, which called for the preservation of scenic parks and would later influence the national park system. He had moved to California in 1863 and was managing the Rancho La Mariposa Estate and Garden Mines. And this experience and seeing the changes in the landscape from his childhood to then led him to writing the report. Also, the place went bankrupt and he had to leave. But his son would later draft legislation in 1916 that would create the national parks and he would use this report to help with his campaign for Niagara Falls where in the late 60s and early 70s I think he was one of the people campaigning for the preservation of the falls and then when that succeeded he and Vox actually started actually submitted other plans or reports for the falls. During his time as a designer, he has been best known for the following works, Central Park, as well as the Biltmore Estates in North Carolina, the U.S. Capitol in D.C., and the 1893 World Columbian Exposition, which would have been in Chicago, Illinois. He ended up forming his first design firm, Olmsted Vox & Company, which lasted until 1872 when it was dissolved and he formed Olmsted and Sons, a practice where he worked and designed with the Sons until 1883. He finally retired in 1895 after a long-lasting career, which spanned a total of 38 years. The firm would continue for another 100 years, with his son driving the firm forwards under the name the Olmsted Brothers. The firm would reach a total of 6,000 projects before it would be disbanded, although it would also cause a lot of confusion. One of his sons was named Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., and he would often not write Jr. after his name. So there are multiple projects from his sons that have been falsely identified with Sr., as well as letters and other documentation. His son, John Charles, was one of the founding members of the American Society of Landscape Architects, which is the landscape professional organization, and he was almost never mentioned, despite being right there alongside his father and brother, and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. founded Harvard's landscape design program with others, which was also the first in the history of the world. In 1895, Olmsted Sr. was finally forced to retire permanently, and he was hospitalized due to declining mental health due to old age until he passed, and he was buried in the Old North Cemetery in Hartford, Connecticut. And that concludes part one of Central Park. On the next episode, it's going to be a much longer episode, diving more into the story of the land acquisition, Seneca Village, and the entire history, renovations, and design. And this background info we discussed today will be essential to understanding the episode coming out on Monday. As always, please rate, review, and subscribe everywhere you get your podcast from. We are on iHeartRadio, I'm currently trying to put us on YouTube podcast and we are on Apple, Spotify, and more. 
You can find me on Instagram at Architecture Coffee and Ink. Join the Facebook group. Email the show at Architecture Coffee and Ink at gmail.com or the blog at Architecture Coffee and Ink.com. Architecture Coffee and Ink is a Hollywood C Studios LLC production. I am excited to meet with all my designers, dreamers, and DIY enthusiasts next time. But in the meantime, may your coffee mugs be full and your ink wells never run dry. Yeah.